This is the week two lecture for the Discovering the Grid Origins of the Grid Art 159 Graphic Design Layout course. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about where the grid was first created and how it became so popular and used today among the different media outlets that we use and the different formats that we use as well. So the origins of the grid have been a part of the human experience so the ad, since the advent of writing, if not even earlier. Scribes would line their documents to provide visual guides for orderly composition, and later with the birth of the printing press, blocks of text were set using tiny blocks of type, letter by letter. So this is an example here of the sort of scribes that were creating this sort of layout in this format to contain this information and keep this organized, even within the ancient scribing that we saw uh, of our past. <clears throat> so while the Renaissance painting may seem like a far cry from something like a page layout, it was sort of uh, the the marriage of this sort of architecture and this visual representation that first produced the grid. And it was not called that at the time. This Renaissance painting that we're looking at here was uh, used mathematical principles to really develop this linear perspective as indicated by these lines that are superimposed. And prior to this, artists really struggled with creating an accurate perspective until this was created here where they were able to take a single point within the horizon and align all of those lines up that created this very, very convincing sort of perspective that we see and still use today. And in the 13th century, the architect Villard de Hanecourt came up with a famous diagram that was used for producing page layouts with margins of fixed ratios. And these were considered harmonious designs. And this is an example of Villard's diagram here, which determined the proportions of books from the Renaissance really through present time today. And we can see this being used here within the uh, more modern designs that we can see. And really, as capitalism reached maturity in the late 19th century, people began to think of graphic design as a profession in itself. And the first people to call themselves designers, such as William Morris of the Arts and Crafts Movement began searching for words to which to describe these sort of activities that we can see. Here we can see an example of William Morris's work here that was from the Arts and Crafts Movement. It was a painting, but you can see that he was really starting to use this idea of a grid and layout even within these basic sort of principles of the actual painting and the structure of this format. But the grid did not enter into the graphic design lexicon until around World War I in Switzerland. And this is because it was one of the only neutral countries in the war. Switzerland became a meeting ground for these intellectual refugees from all over Europe. And these conditions amounted to a lot of sharp people that were printing a lot of multilingual documents, often with columns that would be in French, Italian, German, and English. And this presented a design problem that typographers like Herbert Bayer and Jan Chicol stepped up to address. So while Swiss typographers were establishing the centrality of the grid and print design, similar movements occurred in the world of fine art. Now this grid is probably most evident in the Dutch Distill movement founded in 1917 and, how to, how, and headed excuse me, by artists Theo van Dasberg and Piet Mondrian. Here we can see an example of Theo van Dasberg's work on the left and an example of Piet Mondrian's painting on the right. And believing in this democratic and utopian potential of modular design and absolute simplicity, they really limited their canvases to intersecting vertical and horizontal lines and also primary colors. So again, the distilled publication that we can see on the left alongside of the Mondrian painting on the right the grid is clearly apparent in both of these with this strong sort of emphasis of the color red and these basic primary colors that are used within Piet Mondrian's paintings as well. And this brings us to a movement that was brought out from these like-minded individuals called the Bauhaus movement that was very short-lived. It only 
really ran from 1919 to 1933. But the Bauhaus movement was arguably the single most influential modernist art school of the 20th century. And its approach to teaching and to the relationship between art, society, and technology had a major impact in both Europe and in the United States and still rings true today. So today Bauhaus is really renowned for um, the, both its unique aesthetic that inventively combined the fine arts with arts and crafts, as well as its enduring influence on modern and contemporary art. Bauhaus literally translates to construction house. And again, this originated out as a German school of the arts in the early 20th century. It was founded by Walter Gropius and the school eventually morphed into its own modern art movement that characterized its own unique approach to architecture, design, fashion, theater, and so on. And in 1919, the German architect Walter Gropius, who established the Bauhaus, uh, started to unite all these different branches of arts under one roof. And the school acted as a hub for Europe's most experimental creatives with the well-known artists that came out of this, such as Joseph Albers, Wassily Kandinsky, and Paul Klee, that offered some of these expertise as instructors within the school as well. And the Bauhaus movement really declared its guiding principle as a direct relationship between form and function without any unnecessary or decorative components. Now, naturally, this philosophy led them toward the extremely practical grid, as can be seen in this uh, famous Bauhaus chess set, whose pieces are all squares and rectangles, and they're actually made to be fit together to tightly create this compact storage within all of the different pieces that are being used. This is an example here of the 1923 Weimar exhibition from Germany, created by Joost Schmidt. And this is an extraordinary use of a grid to organize this information and they actually are taking this horizontal and vertical grid and spinning it on its axis. They're rotating it to create a much more dynamic layout and composition for the posters. And this was very common among the Bauhaus movement as well. This is an example here of Wassily Kandinsky's composition number no. H, which was created in July of 1923 and currently sits in the Guggenheim Museum. And we can see, again, this use of this very loose sort of golden ratio that is being used, as well as emphasis and this use of the optical center. Now, similar to Bauhaus art, architecture that came from the Bauhaus movement is styled and characterized by this same harmonious, balanced geometric shapes and emphasis on function. And that didn't stop at architecture and art as well. They also did things like uh, furniture, the Wassily chair here by Marcel Brewer was reduced really this traditional plush club chair to its most basic outline in tubular steel and using waxed canvas strips for the seating. And Brewer actually stated in typical Bauhaus fashion, it is the least artistic, the most logical, the least cozy, and the most mechanical. So you can kind of see where their headspace was at during this time. This here is the title page of the Bauhaus Weimar, which was created by Laszlo Maholi. And he was influenced by constructivism and interested and proficient in the field of typography, photography, sculpture, and printmaking, painting, as well as industrial design. And he coll collaborated with Walter Gropius in the making of a series of these different Bauhaus books. There was 14 of them in total. And they really became the manifest of the school, incorporating the ideology of what the school was trying to work towards. Uh, another artist that came out of this is Herbert Bayer. And he can be credited as the father of the Bauhaus typography for his design here of the universal alphabet, which was created in 1925. Now, Bayer proposed the principles of the new typography that sought to reduce letters to their essentials without additional ornaments typical for the black letter typography that was seen at that time that was very ornate and very decorative. 
and he was an advocate of greater legibility, which he provided with this design of very geometrically formed characters with greater distance between them. And he removed the upper and lower cases and the different serifs that were created, leaving these very simple but effective designs that are really still popular today. The Bauhaus is often also credited with emphasizing the importance of both theory and practice in design. And it's sometimes referred to as the birthplace of graphic design. And when you start to do a little bit of research into the Bauhaus movement and some of their work, I think what you'll find is some of the principles that were pulled out of this are still very, very relevant today and are also still very popular today because of that simple aesthetic that they were able to achieve. So later in the movement, Joseph Mueller Brockman, who is deeply influ influenced by these theories of the Bauhaus movement, advocated for a systemization of design and an insistence on objectivity, stating that the designer's calling has a higher purpose. And in his words, the use of the grid as an ordering system is the expression of a certain mental attitude in as much as it shows that the designer conceives his work in terms that are constructive and oriented to the future. At the same time, he can be very practical. He also said, the grid system is an aid, not a guarantee. It, it permits a number of possible uses, and each designer can look for a solution appropriate to their personal style. But one must learn how to use the grid. It is an art that requires practice. So we can see that they are really looking at this as a way to structure information, as a way to aid in their designs, but not necessarily as a way to dictate all of their decisions within their particular layout. The grid is simply a tool for you to use. It does not define your design. It is simply there to aid your design. And that is something that we're going to be looking at throughout the entirety of this course. So grids have this practical application, and that's why they are still used today. They allow for better organization of information, a stronger hierarchy among the design elements, and a more balanced and cohesive design as they make the designer's job easier. And we can see this in all sorts of different publications and designs. Oftentimes, you will see designs that use a very clear grid structure, and they might have elements that go outside of that grid structure to break the grid, so to speak, creating some point of emphasis and some interest within the design. And that's okay. Again, the grid is there to aid you in where it is needed, but there are times and spaces where you might need to break that grid, and that is something that as a designer, you should feel more and more comfortable with and be able to make those appropriate decisions. The use of the grid is used in all styles of formats and publication, whether it is a printed piece or on the web. If you've ever gone to a website before, oftentimes you'll notice that whether you're looking on the website on your phone, on your desktop, or on your tablet, the website looks very similar, but the grid might change within those different structures. And obviously that's due to the format, right? When we are looking at something on our phone, we're typically scrolling from top to bottom. When we are looking at something on our desktop, we have a much larger screen that is much more horizontal in the format. And within the tablet, it's somewhere in between, depending on how you're using that. So within the different grids that we are using and that we are manipulating within these different formats, it's very important to consider how this grid is going to be used and adapted throughout these different uh, ways that you are going to be viewing this. And this is again referred to as an adaptive format grid. It is going to adapt to whatever it is that you are working on within that particular uh, format. If you are looking at the website on a cell phone, it's going to position that grid differently. If you are looking at it on a desktop or a tablet, it's going to show that in the space that works best for that format. Please watch the videos that are also included in the module and reach out if you have any questions.